If you want to look inside in real time of what it's really like to set up and run one of the biggest card shows in the world, this is the episode for you because this card show is going on. Rob Varis is the founder. We got a lot to talk about now. And here we go. Welcome to another episode of the Jeff Wilson Show. And we are on the show floor of the Burbank Card Show. It currently, as we're filming this, is Saturday afternoon. It is peak hours, especially upstairs where all of the dealer tables are right now is absolutely insane. If you're watching the vlogs on the Sports Card Investor Channel, you're probably getting a sense for that. And this guy, Rob Varis, of course, the, the, of course, the head of Burbank Sports Cards and also one of the heads now of the Burbank Card Show. This was a creation with, with Rob and, and others here in the community to put together this card show. And right now, Rob, I know you're tired. You are in the thick of it. You look tired. You exhausting. actually look tired. It's exhausting. It, it, so, so pick up, wait, I, you gotta pick up your mic there. We'll see if you can hold that up through exactly. the whole thing. But I wanna break down for the audience what this is like right now. Like you having all the work you put into this thing, what this is like, what you were trying to do with the show, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, because I think it's such kind of a real-time fascinating case study yeah. into this card show and maybe the future of card shows. Yeah, just quick briefly, I mean, we've only been doing card shows for a year. Our first card show was August 26th of 2022. That was our first one. It's almost exactly one year ago. Almost exactly yeah. one year ago. And... That one was crazy. The lines all the way around the building, fire marshal build, you know. But that was oh. a very small show. I mean, that entire, I went to that show, that entire show could have probably fit into a, a quarter of this room. And yet there's two stories uh, to this show. They, the audience can't even see actually the upstairs. This, this show is 14 times the size. 14 times the, the size. Uh, yeah, okay. 14 times the size of wow. our first one. Okay. Um, it's been a rocket ride. We've done three different shows, three different cities, three different facilities, dealing with three different companies at those facilities at three different scales. So we haven't done the same show twice. Right. And so we've had to prove it, prove it, prove it the whole way. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to put together a national level show in the best location, in the best facility, and kind of challenge ourselves, can we pull this off? Yeah. Before we continue, I want to let you know that DraftKings Rainmakers football is back for its second season, and it's bigger and better than ever before. Head to DraftKings.com slash audio and sign up to play Rainmakers today with code GWS for your share of over $30 million in prizes this football season. This week, new customers can claim their first pack of digital player cards for free to get started. Playing Rainmakers football is simple. Each DraftKings digital card represents an athlete and scores points based on their real-world performance. Draft them into weekly contests for your shot at a share of $30 million in prizes or sell them anytime on the DraftKings marketplace. Rainmaker contests require no fee to join as long as you have enough cards to complete a lineup. So rip packs, build your collection, and earn big rewards. Wondering how to get started? New customers visit DraftKings.com slash audio today and use promo code GWS to claim a free starter pack only at DraftKings.com slash audio with code GWS. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Age and eligibility restrictions apply. Rainmakers contests are not available in certain states. One starter pack per customer. Starter pack player cards are ineligible for resale. See terms at DraftKings.com slash Rainmakers. I think this is the largest show. Is this, is this the largest card show ever to happen in history outside of the national? Oh yeah, I it's don't gotta think it's be close. right. You know, this is national size. So this is two hundred thousand square right. feet. Right, and so I mean, other than other than the national, I think this has got to be the largest card show out there. I mean, it, I think this facility is larger than some of the past nationals. Yeah, um, it's hard to say how big the nationals were back in the day. Right, they used to have them here. I don't know which hall they were in, mm -hmm. um, but it's not about the size of it. It's about the vibe. It's about the excitement. Southern California has been neglected since 2006 of having a national level show. Yeah. And they don't plan on coming back till at least 2028, correct? Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're locked through 20... in, yeah, through for several years now. And you know, I, I would say 97% of the people on this floor have never been to the national. Right. And they've been waiting for something to come to Southern California. These are all fresh eyeballs. These are people that 
if the national doesn't come back here, they're not going to engage with them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their sponsors won't be able to engage with them. And there's a void. And it's the best market in the country. I think bar none, not even close. And again, if you polled everybody here, have you been to the national before? Are you going to Cleveland? Will you go to Atlantic City? I'm guessing 95% of the answer is no. Yeah. When the people in that line that I saw, I see these families walking around. What does it cost for a family of four to leave the state to go to a card yeah. show? And I mean, this the Southern California card scene, and, and I mean, California in general, like it's so massive, The not only the population, but it seems like the collector base here is more established than in most other parts of the country as well, from what I've experienced. Which is kind of crazy because you would think the East Coast would be it. More generational teams have been around a lot longer. Sports has been around a lot longer. But I challenge any city to go up against Southern California or L.A. The, I believe the best shops, the nicest shops. And you've toured the shops yeah. in Southern California. I think for the most part, my, my, um, my, my fellow card shop owners mm. do an amazing job. And you can tell me Dallas, you can say New York, and I'm like, nah, nah. Yeah. You look around here, you'll know it's Southern California. Well, and, and it is a void, as you said. The National actually had their biggest card show ever in Anaheim. Actually, it was right here, right? It was right, right here in 1991. 91. It was well, the literally... Line, the lines were the longest. I don't know if the floor space was the biggest. Right. But the, the lines were absolutely crazy. Yeah. And so it, it, the National has already proven that the Southern California card market's insane. Right. But why has the National neglected in a, in a sense, right? They've, they've stayed in the middle of the country. They've right. gone to the East Coast. Right. But you said they haven't been back to California since 2006, and they won't be back for several years at a minimum. It'll be so, 22 years. Yeah, um, at least. I just, how do I want to put this? <laughs> um, the facilities that they hold these events in don't cost them a whole lot of money to right. put them on. Um, this facility would stagger you how much it costs yeah. to put it on. So I think it's the cost of the facility. And I think it's the membership of the voting committee for the national. Um, most of them are older. Most of them are on the Eastern seaboard. And from what I understand, most of them want to be able to get into a car, a van or truck yeah. and be able to drive to the show. And so that's why it hasn't been West of Chicago since it's not just the West Coast, it's just it's middle America right. too. Anything past Chicago or Rosemont, it hasn't been, I, I don't even know. Yeah. And it's not fair, I don't think, to the market out here. Uh, I think it's short-sighted and um, there was a void. And the whole reason we started this, Jeff, was during COVID, Dallas was open, Texas was open. Yeah. And so we're having people spend $800 to put their feet on the floor at the Dallas card show. That money evaporated airlines hotels that money's gone and i'm like we need something around here I, I didn't want to do it per se but i had a brief conversation with jay my director of logistics and i was thinking something really small because i don't know anything about running shows and jay's like no we're not doing the elks lodge <laughs> it's still the joke that we have today i'm like yeah dude the elks lodge would be perfect and he's like are you crazy so it's amazing how it's grown um i think that we'll actually be able to move to a bigger venue next year we're doing ontario um the week so the next one right so this one right now obviously labor day weekend is when we're filming this here so your next one is already planned you're yes. doing two a year that's two a year. The, that's the pace that you guys are trying to do so you're also out doing the national in that regard too right which is one thing i've never understood with the national i i think the national could support two a year they could do more of an east coast east yeah. to mid and they sure. could do a west coast but hey, they've left a void open. You've ta you're taking advantage of the void the Nationals left behind, right? Yeah, so just, it, I don't even think I'm doing that. I'm just the West Coast deserves this. Yeah. And I think that people are showing up in mass. I mean, it, it's unbelievable that again, it's just it's a void, and it's just it's almost unexplainable. Yeah. To be honest with you, that you would literally cut off more than half the country. Uh, you know, Chicago's way closer to the East Coast than here. I, I didn't understand it and used to frustrate me. I used to go buy pallets of cards mm -hmm. and I used to sit there and go, it would be so much nicer if it was here and I can get the cards back easily. Right. Or I could stay home and be, it, it, and I'm like, why doesn't it ever come out here? Now, to be honest with you, I could care less if it ever came back. Yeah. So Honestly. You just, you're going to recreate that here. Okay. We're so going to do get, the best we can. You got on. Uh, Ontario, California, not Ontario, Canada. Some Just, people was, think even was, in California, yes, they I, think I, that. I was confused when, when I went to go book my plane flights to go to the Ontario show last year, I typed in Ontario. I'm trying to figure out why these tickets are like $1,300. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. 
these are tickets to go to Canada, <laughs> not tickets to go to California. I got that figured out, thankfully. Um, but yeah, so you've got Ontario, California. That's coming up in February, what, weekend week after, after the Super Bowl yes. this year. Okay, mm -hmm. last year was Super Bowl weekend. This next year is going to be the weekend after the Super Bowl, and and you've even expanded the show floor in Ontario from yeah. what it was last time. Sure. The um, we had Hall A, basically, and we had some of the different rooms. Hall A was seventy thousand feet, huge leap for us. Um, now we'll get the whole entire space. I think it's like one hundred twenty thousand feet yeah. total. Um, it's much smaller than this, though. But the key for us is when you're getting convention space, it's not always available. They might be booked out three years yeah. and getting space, especially this kind of quality space, it's really difficult. Yeah. So this is, and I will say this is a very nice space. So part of my complaint that I've had about other card shows and I've done, you know, I've done Jeff Wilson shows about this and you've even, you've even commented that you agreed on some of the things like the, you know, uh, you know, we saw, I mean, frankly, we saw at the national this year, you know, uh, air conditioning, real real problem at the National right. this year, right? The show floor, it, it I mean, it, it, that Chicago Center, although there's many conveniences with all the hotels there and everything, it looks dingy. The lighting's bad. There's no natural light. There's the the floor's kind of old. There's obviously no carpet. It's it's just the whole thing is 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 dingy. Right. I love so much about Chicago and the fact that you've got all the hotels and the restaurants yeah, and the awesome. sky bridges, but the show floor is dingy. Here it's the opposite. The show floor is there's actually natural light you know coming in this direction the camera can't see it but you got natural light you got you know carpet you got high ceilings feels very good having nice high ceilings you got good lighting everything's bright you got an open show floor i mean this is a really nice environment to do it in would you agree that this is the nicest facility you've ever gone to for a card show i would agree i would agree and, and ontario honestly last time was pretty nice as it's well nice building nice it building. was nice it didn't have the carpet but it still had a nice it was a new facility yeah. it felt it was a nice new convention center yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh so we have that one booked um, through 2025 for the first part of the year. Then we're going to do whatever big show we can do, and we're you probably think it's going to be Labor bigger. Day weekend again next year. It's whatever the it's whatever they say is available. Okay, it so might be middle of August, middle of okay. September. But the pattern's going to be yeah a, a little Q1 bit of a smaller Q, show Q1, at Q3. the beginning of the year. The next few will be in Ontario, California. And then a bigger show later in the year, We're looking, sometime around Labor Day. Right. And if and if Ontario is too small for that first quarter, we'll go bigger. Right. Um, we're seeing what we did this year. Talking to the person that runs this center, she's like, "We need to get you a bigger space, and we need to make this more available for you." Mm -hmm. So it's just like, wow. Yeah. She was at the end of the line, and she's like, "Rob, this is absolutely crazy." So. Um, we think we have some, some uh, rocket sauce. We're having conversations. A lot of people are looking at what we're doing and they have an excitement. There's only so, I think there's probably a limit to what we can do as a card show as three people with only one full time. Um, so maybe there'll be some help down the road to supersize things. Um, but we're going to do our best at damnedest if it's just us or whatever the future might hold. We're going to give Southern California the ultimate collecting yeah. event. And what you will also realize here, Jeff, no signers. We had right. Fernando, Sosha, and Outman for like two hours right. in the corner. Yeah. There's no autograph pavilion. Yeah. And we drew this many people. It's a, yeah, pure, it's a pure card show. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, the, and the, you can't see the dealer floor, but the dealer floor upstairs where the actual dealer tables are is insane. It's, insane. it's only gotten more insane since yeah. this morning. Now, you're, you know, being, now obviously, a, a huge event like this, though, doesn't go off without some hitches, especially as you're doing things for the very first time, right? So I'm like, what what over the last 24 to 48 hours have you learned that you're like kind of taking notes of for next time? Yeah, just line management is always an issue. We try to get better. We're still not there yet. And it's a learning experience. And there's certain rules and regulations that the convention center has about entry points. You have to have a wand go over you. Right, they got o security here. Ontario had a metal detector. Anaheim had wands, which slows things down dramatically. And they want things through one entrance. So dealing with that. The hardest part, to be honest, when you go to this scale and these types of facilities, the really good ones, is unions. Yeah. And I was told originally it wasn't union. And that was a lie. To be honest, we'd already started selling tables, all of that. And I don't want my vendors getting nickel and dimed like some other shows that might have in different areas that are union, they're getting nickel and dimed. And we took the guy in charge out to lunch and said, hey, look, what's the number? What's the number to eliminate the nickel and diming to our dealers? 
what's the nickel and diming to get them in easier and not have to deal with, you know, BS for lack of a better term. They came up with a number and we just paid it. We just paid it. It was worth it to us because we want this to be problem free. We want this to represent my brand. Uh, my face is on this, Jeff. My, my brand is on this. So things that go sideways are a bad reflection on me. So if I can eliminate some of those things, I'm going to do it. And I, I, I'd be remiss if we haven't even mentioned EJ and Jay yet. Jay's the director of logistics. This place doesn't look like this without him. The, the nightmare that's involved with dealing with the convention yeah. center, dealing with all the different vendors and all the corporate and getting everything in and getting it right. And the show floor up top, nobody has aisles that wide and that clean. It looks great. Then EJ's the one that's under the gun. He's the event director. Mm -hmm. He's, I'm kind of the fun face, the brand, you know, well, how's it going, what's going on? But EJ's the one that's dealing with the day-to-day, seven-day-a-week, everybody's upset about something. Everybody thinks they're more special than someone else mm -hmm. and trying to get that through. And everyone's trying to get people through for free. And I'm yeah. like, you no, know, you know, it's not happening. So it's, it's a partnership. Even my wife, Sally, she's the card mother. She does all the financials and she does this part-time. So there is no crew of 12 people. Yeah. There's no, um, there's, there's none of that. There's, it's all just us. Well, and you got obviously another full-time job, and you got your own then card some. shop, yes. and, and, then and then some. some. You know, one of the one of the biggest card shops in the world. Uh, this is a lot different business model than the card shop. I mean, the card shop is a constant, ongoing, you know, business that you're managing, relatively steady. Uh, you know, whereas this is a one-time event, and it's this hustle up to one moment, and that moment's going to occur no matter. Yeah. If you want it to or not, no right. matter if you're ready or not, here it is. These are the dates. Everyone's showing up. It better be. It better be good to go. How has it been like adjusting between those two very different models? You know, it's exhausting. Um, when you look around and you see everything, and your brand and your face are are there, it's rough because you want everyone to have the ultimate experience at your show. Um, you're, again, the shop is chaotic, but you kind of know what to expect. Mm. The lead up to this. Everybody procrastinates stuff, trying to get people paid and different corporates and you have to chase people and, you know, budgets are tiny and it's just like trying to get blood from a stone. And I'm like, I saw what you guys did at the national. I'm like, what the hell? You know, I'm right. sitting there looking at that. And now that they're seeing the traffic here, I think they're going to level up for next year. So that was a little disappointing with some of that. Um, but again, I haven't proven the kind of traffic that I think we proved today. Yeah. These, these corporates, for the most part, have never been on the West Coast. Yeah. They have never been in front of these eyeballs, have never set up activations with these people. And EJ's the one that's really been the tip of the spear dealing with that. But if you look over there yep. at my booth, yep. how many people are over there? There's a lot. So, so just because the camera can't see, we got Burbank has their own setup here on the corporate part of the floor, and it's all like dollar bins and value bins, just tons and tons and tons of dollar bins and value bins. And that's actually interesting because normally the bigger, the, the higher level the card show, the less of that you see. It's wrong. Because people don't want, you know, dealers don't want to buy all this table space at a premium sure. to get, you know, to put, to put dollar boxes right. out, right? Um, but you've you've done that here in a, to a very very big scale. Well, luckily I know the promoter, right. so well, I was able yes, to get that helps. Space. Of course, that helps. But this is an extension of my brand. Sure. It's the Burbank experience. You know, the marching orders. What this whole thing was. I don't mind if we lose money doing it, but don't embarrass the brand. Mm -hmm. And so the Burbank experience is built on going online, buying a hundred different cards, putting in a shopping cart, best delivered price. It's built on coming in the store and put your hands on cards. I'm a firm believer people want to put their hands on cards and yeah. everyone's like the hobby's dead no one wants to do that look at my booth yeah. look at my store it's you just have to put the effort in and these high-end shows are great but if the burbank brand's going to be attached to it it's going to have that and it's going to be exclusive right. you to gotta, burbank you got to have people, people are spending yeah. hours at these tables and that's what it's about people forget about hobby the ultra modern the um all the um content creators yourself included Sometimes we forget, we take the eye off the prize. The yeah. prize is collecting, the prize is looking for Easter eggs. And you know, the prize is building some kind of collection mm -hmm. and it gets lost in the shuffle. And I scream from the highest pulpit all the time that it's a damn hobby. And it, it, we've gotten away yeah. from that as an industry. Yeah. And that's at every level. 
you know, there's a lot of quick bucks. There's a lot of flipping. There's a lot of all these things. It's a lot of flash. A lot you know, of there's flash. a lot of the hundred thousand dollar car, the ten thousand dollar car, and of course, I mean, you know, I do a lot of that on my channel. Sure, of people, course, people like to see it. But I agree with you that there's there's a lot of you know there's a lot of heart and soul sure. in the dollar bins. People, and, you don't no one goes on social media that they went through my Bo Jackson right, section right. and found 42 cards and they were stoked. They that was their budget. They walked out of here happy. They spent an hour looking through cards. Mm -hmm. They're not going on Instagram and and like I call them the silent majority, Jeff. The majority of people in this hobby are those folks. Yeah. But you don't. They're not flashy. Yeah. But that's okay. But my job is to make sure that it's always a hobby. Yeah. Because I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I speak from the highest okay. mountain that breaking should not be the forward-facing right. part of the industry. It really should be. It's a damn hobby. Yeah. It really should be fathers and sons going through cards, picking their favorite players, building PCs, then starting to level up from there. We can't have them simply be, just gamble. Yeah. That's not the forward-facing part of the industry I want. When I want... They can start there, they can build up, and then maybe eventually they should be doing breaks. But I'm Adam, I'm, I'm the tuba player going the wrong way, Jeff. I was talking to Mike Mahan yesterday, and I know how he feels about breaking, but he knows it's not perfect. But there's just gotta be more love shown to what this industry's looking for. Yeah, I understand that. Now I would now a lot of you know, a lot of card shops, and I think card shows as well, that have limited space are probably thinking to themselves, well, I can't make that much money on dollar bins. Right. You know, I can, I, I, if I can sell a thousand dollar card and get a 30% profit margin, I made $300. Right. But how many dollar cards do I have to sell till I eventually make back that same $300? And that thousand dollar card took up that much space in my store. All these dollar bins are gonna take up that much space. Why is that, should they be thinking that way? No. Or are you saying that's, that's flawed Completely thinking? Completely wrong. Completely wrong. Um, you need to grow your community. Look at it. Look at it from. Go around the counter and look at it from the consumer's point of view. And you're walking around thousand dollar boxes, five hundred dollar boxes, thousand dollar slabs. You know, you're looking at back room. All they're doing is breaking. You walk in as a family. Is that attractive? Mm. It's not attractive to me. Not at all. First impression is I can't afford this hobby. Mm. Now we're getting rid of another generation. We've done so much to grow this, but if we forget that it's a damn hobby, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And you better have price points. I preach it every day. Value, price points, Easter eggs. People want to put their hands on the cards, Jeff. It's, it's a misnomer that everything is about grading. Mm -hmm. It's a misnomer that everything is about social media. It's a misnomer because those are the people screaming the loudest. Right. And I think it's wrong. And I my job is to represent the hobby in the best possible light. And I think I've done it here. I think I've done it through my online business, and I certainly know I've done it through my card shop. Yeah. And there's a reason that we keep leveling up, and that's because we don't forget that it's a damn hobby. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. And, you know, you have built a brand around that because not just in your card shop, and I've been in there several times, and these dollar bins, you, you have them out, you know, all over the shop, bins for people to take out, sorted by player. But then online on eBay, you've got millions of cards right. and, and probably, I mean, if I had to guess your average card on eBay is probably under 10 bucks, right? right. I mean, it's, oh yeah, it's, definitely. You know, definitely. maybe, maybe even a Way couple lower. of bucks or Way something. Lower, yeah. 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 And so you just, it's just, is it just at that level? Is it just kind of all about volume and that's how, that's how you make it work? I think what's misunderstood, maybe about me, maybe not. People that really know me kind of understand this. It's not all about the money. For me, a lot of it's about legacy these days as I get older, you know, just trying to show people that it's a hobby. And we've sold six million cards on eBay in our career, which is absolutely unbelievable. What people have to understand though, when you have that kind of selection, that long tail, if you will, somebody might find you on a random search for Mark Grace and see that you have that card that no one else does, that drags them into your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So every fresh listing I have out there is an opportunity to bring in a buyer. So when you can go wide like that and you could dominate search and they realize it's $30 free shipping, it's only 99 cents. I could put 30 different cards in my shopping cart and have them delivered of my favorite player or my favorite team from a certain year. It's huge. And if we get away from all that, industry's dead. If we get away from providing liquidity, no industry. If we get away from get, making it a hobby, there's no industry. 
We, it, there's too much short. We've seen what's happened to the market, Jeff. Mm -hmm. It wasn't sustainable, but you know what? That never went away. The dollar bins, yeah, the dollar bins stayed strong. Even, stayed even strong. Thro even throughout the ups and downs of the market. Yeah. The dollar bin, you know, the, the, that's a fair point, right? The, the price point of a 1987 Topps Mark Grace card, for example, did, did Grace play in 87? No. He, he might have been after that. He 88 Tops traded. Eight, there you go. That was, yeah, I was a year early on his rookie card. I'm thinking back to my childhood. <laughs> um, Close. That's fair. Well, let's say, you know, we'll, we'll go like with a Will Clark, you know, 87 Tops Will Clark right. card. The price point on that card, raw condition, probably didn't go up or down at all right. during the COVID, you know, up and down because it's not, it's not the card that, that everyone was chasing. But, but what you have to understand is, We've been fortunate. We brought back so many lapsed collectors that were in the hobby in the mid 80s, early 90s, and that's their memories. And they remember collecting Will Clark cards when they can go through my box and find all kinds of inserts and parallels and they're a dollar, they're two dollars. They're like 12 years old again. Yeah. And I don't think that quite translates to case breaks. I don't think that translates to high end slabs whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's an extended adolescence. If we can bring people into the hobby, leave your troubles at the door, put your hands on the cards, feel like you're 14 or 12 years old again, and that's critical. I'm not all about the money. And I think anybody that knows me knows that I didn't build this to get rich quick. And I think people see the grind that I do, see what I built, and understand that Rob does this because he really loves it. Right. And I hope that they think that and they know that. But the fast buck, isn't the long term in this industry. Mm -hmm. It can't be. Mm -hmm. If we don't have sections like that, if we don't have organized things, if we don't have products mm -hmm. to fit the right price points. Yeah. During COVID, we have yeah. $80 blaster boxes. We yeah. turned off a lot of people. Yeah. I think Tops and uh, Fanatics are doing a hell of a job of creating products at the right price points. And, and that's huge. Baseball's overtaken basketball. Mm -hmm. And I think that's from what Fanatics has done. Having available product, having things at 20 to $30 stickers, that's what gets people Tops in. does do a good job of that. Like series one, series two, those types of products. There you get a lot of cards. Right. The boxes aren't expensive. You can get in there and get it, you know, get a ton of stuff. It's good. Yeah, for whatever reason, I mean, you know, Panini has products like NBA hoops, which try to serve that need, although even hoops got silly right. expensive at times during COVID. Um, but it, it doesn't um, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to connect as well with baseball. There's like more of a connection with the Topps flagship prop, right? You know, it's products, more generational, Tops Chrome, you know that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's there's also they're not going through distributors anymore for right. the most part. That's where the bloat was. That's where I thought that the industry jumped the shark. Where a product that was eighty dollars was hitting at three hundred dollars. Yeah. And it was the distributors that were just getting rich. Yeah. And the end consumer was the one that was getting, you know, for lack of a better term, screwed by it. Yeah. And the um, what was I going to say the um. The value of the cards in the box didn't translate anywhere near right, yeah. what the product was. Yeah. And all you got to do is burn somebody once or twice yeah. and they're out. And I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. So I think getting rid of that distributor bloat and Tops being able to sell it on their own site. Everyone's like, why would I compete with Tops? I'm like, and Fanatics. I'm like, Fanatics is going to get that stuff in the hands of people we only dreamed of. And then if, if, if you're doing your job right and they sold it to someone in your neighborhood, you, you're going to do well. Yep. And you got to think long term. You can't think short term. And I'm a firm believer that there needs to be more hobby shops. Yep. People look at me like I have three heads. I'm like, no, those are billboards for the industry. Mm -hmm. You get them, they get the you, they get them into the ecosystem. It's your job now to be able to market to get them into your ecosystem. Yeah. But it takes one point in time for them to get into a store, and then they're hooked. I mean, there's nothing like this hobby. Yeah. All it takes, but all it takes is one or two bad interactions for them to sour. And if mom isn't pleased, then all of a sudden. Everything shuts down. So to me, it's always mom. Yeah, yeah. Mom we talked holds about the purse that strings. Before. Yeah. yeah. What, and so what's really interesting, what I've experienced here being at this car show over the last 24 hours, I'd say the majority of the people that I have met on the car show floor say, this is my first car show. Yeah. This is the first car show I've ever been to before. Sure. The majority yeah. I, I are saying that to me. I, I hear the same thing. A lot of moms, a lot of dads with their kids. Um, and they're here and they've seen it on YouTube. They bought some packs, you know, they've that kind of thing, but they've never actually gone and maybe they've been to a car shop or two, but they've never experienced a show and they've heard about this and they're excited to come for the first time. And it should, that, that's incredible. Like, you know, so many people over the last couple of years were like predicting the demise of the hobby with, with the prices falling and, you know, people losing money on big cards. And I kept saying throughout that entire time period, I said, 
if interest in the hobby were dying off, I would agree with you. But everything I'm seeing shows prices are falling, but interest is not waning at all. And the number of new people continue to come in. Like we, it may not be quite as many as it was back in 2020, but there still is a very consistent flow of new people into this hobby every single month. You probably see it in your shop. We have record, record amounts of people coming through. You see? Everybody's new, yeah, you treat them right, you give them the tour, yeah. you treat, you know, and then all of a sudden, you got someone. But you, we, we can't have the forward-facing part of this industry fractionalize gambling. Yeah. I, I speak on it, and I'm not a popular guy when I talk on it, but at the end of the day, that's not what's going to 3X and 5X this industry. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. And it's a short, it's a short solution. What's going to do it is grassroots, getting cards into the hands of kids, moms willing to go to the shop for 90 minutes during the week, and let their kids shop because it's wholesome, because they really enjoy it. And um, they tell their friends and they tell their friends. And I'm always about mom. Mom is more social. Mom will get on Instagram and show what their sons are doing. And they talk way more than us dads do. And it just becomes viral. So yeah, I just, the best days are ahead. I, there's a reason I work my ass off. There really is, because I know that we're still in early days and people might not understand that, we're still in early days. Yeah. And I keep telling people, I'm just getting warmed up. There you go. I love it. I love it, Rob. Well, this has been incredible. I know you're a busy guy. A so busy guy. We're going to let you get back to the show floor. You've also got to rest that voice up. you still got another, you know, 24 hours or so to get through here. What are you doing when this is all said and done and the show wraps up end of day tomorrow? What, what, what do you do? Do you sit back with a Coors Light? Are you going on vacation somewhere? Are you starting to work on the next one? What do you, what do, you do when this thing ends? Going to the beach on Monday. Great. Just, just, I just have to Great. just breathe for a second. Great. I can't believe this place. And I yeah. really appreciate you coming out yeah. with the family. and brought, uh, the, brought the wife and all three kids to this one. In fact, right now, my wife and my daughter are across the street at Disney World, at Disneyland. And my, uh, they were here yesterday. And then today they went over to Disneyland. And my two sons are here somewhere on the show floor. Uh, you know, walking around, doing trades with other kids, that kind of Would thing. Would you agree that this is the best destination for a card show? Oh, I love it. I mean, my wife, my wife, obviously, she's she's not into cards herself. She likes to go to support the kids. Right. But, you know, she's not crazy about going to certain shows. Like, you know, you go to Dallas and it's, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere in Allen, Texas. And so, you know, she's those types of things. It's like, well, the, you know, it's, what, what's, what am I going to do? What is the daughter going to do if she gets bored? And, uh, but then this one, it was like, well, we're actually across the street. We're across the street from Disneyland. Yeah. So we're actually staying over at the Disneyland Hotel That's awesome. and uh, getting that whole experience. And so, in fact, even after I leave the show tonight, we're going to go catch the last few hours at the park awesome. and watch the fireworks. And did, did you see the fireworks from the yes. top patio? What other from show? Trade ends, night. Yeah, what trade other night. show? Yeah. What other show ends with fireworks? That's yeah, crazy, that was, right? That was really cool. A trade night last night. There was, a, there was a, it was outdoor on an upstairs patio here and you could, it was literally overlooking uh, Disneyland. You could see all the fireworks, yeah, it was neat. I love this location, yeah. I really do. Well, this is great, Rob. Well, we're, we're cheering for the next one. I hope you enjoy your time at the beach. Yeah, it might be it and, too. And we'll, we'll see you uh, in Ontario. Hopefully we'll see some of these folks in Ontario, California, the week after the Super Bowl, February, 2024. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's next. Good stuff, Rob. Thank you very much. And Thank for you, everyone Jeff. out there, you guys know Burbank Sports Cards and Burbank Card Show. And, uh, of course, the Jeff Wilson Show. These shows are available full-length episodes on YouTube as well as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So make sure to subscribe on your podcast platform as well. We appreciate you. We'll see you for the next one. Take care.